Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, how's DragonCon going for you so far? Awesome. Good, still some energy. Excellent, excellent. So uh, my name is Ilanka Dunin, and I'm going to be speaking on Cryptography 101. Uh, this is a, a new talk for me. Generally, I speak about specific ciphers. Uh, in this case, I'm going to be giving some information about how to solve ciphers and also some examples of simple ciphers. So um, there are lots of classical ciphers. These are the ones I'm going to be talking about, not the kind of ciphers that you get like when you put your uh, your bank card into an ATM, not going to cover those because those you really can't cover with pencil and paper. Those are computer ciphers that generally involve like the multiplication of prime numbers that are 100 digits long and not covering those. So uh, classical ciphers, though, uh, they have been existing for many hundreds, thousands of years. The oldest one that I have found is this one is in a cuneiform from uh, Babylon, and it was a clay tablet from about 1300 BC, and it was um, for the recipe of a glaze, and someone was trying to kind of obfuscate the recipe so that people couldn't steal his recipe for the specific uh, uh, items to be used for that glaze. And it was an interesting system, and I'm still kind of learning about specifically how they encrypted it. Uh, it, it involved Babylonian puns, believe it or not. Uh, they, they, had, they were using the sounds of things to disguise it. And so you, you can, as I said, you can kind of figure out which symbols were pressed into the clay, and then we kind of transcribe those, and then we translate those. And I'm not going to go into the details of these. I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to put together a whole talk on just this one tablet. This tablet is about this big okay it's a tiny tiny tablet afterwards uh when they did recipes they tended not to encrypt them but the babylons were the first that were really kind of recording all of this stuff so uh encryption systems that we're going to be covering here are the basic ones which are substitution transposition steganographic and mnemonic, or what we call abbreviation ciphers. So substitution is where you're swapping out one letter for another, or sometimes one word for another, or you're swapping out uh, maybe a, a two-letter pair for another. Transposition is where all the letters are still there, they're just scrambled in a different way. Steganographic is a way of hiding a message. So it's not entirely clear that there is a message. And I'll come back to that in a minute. And then mnemonic or abbreviation, this always comes up because people will bring in a book or something and they say, I think that this is an encrypted book. Um, how do I read it? And I'll say, aha, it's not really encrypted. It's an abbreviation cipher. And again, I'll, I'll come more into that, but I wanted to kind of touch on what I was going to be showing. So substitution, this is where you're swapping out one letter for another letter or a letter for a symbol. And the people that are most famous for doing this are the Freemasons. There's this thing called the Freemason cipher. Now they didn't invent this cipher, which is also called the pig pen cipher. However, they used it more often than anyone else did. And so it's often called the Freemason cipher. Um, this is a an example of a transposition cipher. This particular one is called a turning grill encryption, which is done by uh, taking this item that you kind of see on the right, the brown, uh, the grill, and writing letters into that and then turning the grill. And I'll show you an example of that. And then steganographic. Steganographic would be like invisible ink say you write a letter and then in between the lines of the letter you write something in lemon juice or onion juice or some other type of chemical system and george washington was famous for doing this this was one of the types of encryption that he used most often and getting the chemicals for it was a big thing for him he was always trying to have enough of the chemicals that he needed to encrypt all of the messages that he needed he used other systems as well but this is one of the systems that he used another one you could think of as black light messages so if you've been through escape rooms you may have seen that there are places where you have to uh, collate information and then bring it to an area where there's a black light showing so that you can see 
some other message that's showing through with the black light. The tattooed messenger, this is the oldest one that we've been able to find. This is uh, going back to Persia. So this was written by the historian Herodotus. And he said that a message, they were trying to send it across enemy lines. Well, they knew that a messenger was going to be searched when he, sent, when he was sent. So how could they get a message across? So what they did is they took a messenger, they shaved his head, they tattooed a message on his skull, they waited for the hair to grow back, and then they sent him across enemy lines. So when he got across enemy, he was searched, nothing was found. He gets across enemy lines, shaves his head again, points his head at the, the king or the general that he's trying to get the message to. And this is, a, again, an example of steganography. Aside from humans, they also did this with rabbits. So they would take a rabbit, they would shave the fur on the stomach of the rabbit. And again, they would write in some way, inscribe a message on the rabbit and then wait for the fur to grow back and send it across. Steganography, um, I should touch on the word cryptography. <clears throat> this is a Greek word from crypto and graphene. So cryptos is a Greek word that means hidden. And graphene is like graphite, like you'll see in a pencil, which means to write. So hidden writing, cryptography. Uh, then there's cryptology to study things that are hidden, uh, cryptanalysis to analyze or break things that are cryptin, that, that are hidden. And people also, well, what are you? Are, are you a cryptographer? Are you a cryptologist? And they say, even among those of us in the field, we just all call ourselves cryptographers. It just makes it easy. So don't worry if you're calling someone the correct term. Right. Uh, steganography, uh, so stegano, again, graphene is to write. Stegano is covered, like think like stegosaurus, like the lizard with a roof. Okay, so steganography is writing that is covered, that is hidden. And this is what I was talking about with a hidden or a, a mnemonic system. So Freemasons use this often because they weren't, th their ceremonies were supposed to, for anyone here a Freemason? Okay, so you can you know probably uh, agree, just agree with me, okay. Um, <laughs> that there are ceremonies that the Freemasons would do and they're not allowed to communicate these ceremonies to other people. But some of these ceremonies are very detailed and you have sort of a script that needs to be done, right? Nodding, good. Uh, and how do you communicate this script, but without being able to communicate what the script is? And so they would do these things with these mnemonic or abbreviation books where they would just like put the consonants in there. And that would be a way to jog the memory of what had been in that particular ceremony. Okay. Good. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, these are also things that were encrypted uh, newspaper advertisements. This was big in the 19th century. They uh, would put encrypted ads in the newspaper, and sometimes these were for uh, lovers that were communicating messages. And uh, there were other reasons as well. Another talk that I'm working on is from 1850 to 1855, there was a, a British ship captain who was out on the ship, the Enterprise, on a five-year mission from 1850 to 1855. And his family had been discussing how to get messages to him while he's on this long mission. And so what they did is they would put encrypted messages into the Times newspaper uh, once a month. And then whenever he put into port, the theory was he would be able to get copies of the Times. And then he would be able to decrypt these messages and it would give him some news from home. So we're going through trying to find all of these messages over the five years that happened and then decrypt all the messages and put it all kind of into the proper context. These are some other uh, postcards. This was very popular in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, especially among lovers because they couldn't find other ways to communicate. And so they would be sending these postcards. So they knew anything they sent was gonna go through the hands of everyone else in the house. And they didn't want everyone else in the house to be reading their message. And so they would encrypt the, the postcards, okay? Um, but, <clears throat> In general, 
codes were used not for romance, not for ships going out for five-year missions, but were used by the military. And the, a general code or a cipher or a cryptogram, again, these terms can be used somewhat interchangeably, would be in wartime, someone is trying to create a message and they're going to send the message and they want a receiver to get that message and then be able to decrypt it. And these messages need to go back and forth. They want it where if someone intercepts it in the middle, they won't be able to read that message. And these messages need to be able to be written and decrypted in wartime conditions. So bombs going off and things. So you don't want something too complicated, but you want something that can be used fairly quickly, like, hey, we need bombers to go hit here like now. So these are some examples of encryption systems used by the military. One of the oldest here is the one at the bottom, and this is called a skitale, where they would take a, a round rod and they would wrap uh, a leather strip around it, and then they would write a message on that leather strip, and then they would unwrap it and send just the leather strip without the rod. So whoever received it would then need to have a rod of the same diameter so they could wrap that message around this rod of the same diameter so that they could then read the message. And if someone had a rod of different diameter, they wouldn't be able to figure it out. Eventually they could figure it out, but it would take time in order to do it. Okay. So here's a, another example of a, a substitution cipher. This is from a message from 1650 in North America. And anytime anyone talks about lots of encryption, they're going to have to mention this particular book, which is called the Voynich Manuscript, which is considered the most mysterious manuscript in the world. It comes from the 15th century as hundreds of pages of script that we can't read in an alphabet that we don't know with hundreds of pictures of plants that we can't identify. And it's, it's just, it, it, it torques the heads of, of lots and lots of cryptographers. So coming back to substitution, in this case, we're doing what's called monoalphabetic substitution, meaning substitution with a single alphabet, all right? And there are two basic ways that this can be done. One is what's called a no alphabet change. So each letter is being substituted with another letter that looks like a letter, okay? As opposed to each letter being substituted with something that does not look like a letter. It might be a punctuation symbol. It might be a pig pen cipher. It might be just strange doodles that they made up for this particular cipher. So between the two of these, as far as a code breaker is concerned, they are exactly the same. There is no difference between these. It's just a matter of removing this problem of the changed alphabet. So here's an example of, again, a Freemason document that is done without an alphabet change. So all the letters look like letters. And here is a Freemason's document with an alphabet change where the message is there, but it doesn't look like regular alphabets. So to dig down a little deeper on this, this is uh, Sabine Baringold, and he wrote a, a pamphlet called Curiosities of Olden Times in 1896. And in this pamphlet, he created a cryptogram. Now, that he wasn't writing about the cryptogram. This is something he created for this pamphlet, and we call it the Baringold cryptogram. And this is what it looks like, short. And we can see that it is an alphabet change type of cryptogram. So how would we attack this? The first thing that we would do is we would remove this alphabet change part. And the way we'd do this is we'd start with the first symbol, which in this case is that section symbol, and we'd make that an A. And we'd go to the next one, we'd make that a B. And then the next one would be a C. And now with the C, we go A, B, C, D, E, and then we come up to that four again, and we're going to make that one a C2 because any place now that we see a four, we're going to make that a C so that they're all the same. All right. And then we go on to the next place that we have a symbol that is appearing more than once, in this case, the plus sign, which is an H, and we're going to make every plus sign an H and so forth. There's another A. 
when we go through. So when we're done, we now have that same cryptogram, but it's in letters. And this is something that is easier to type into a computer, and it's something that our brain can munch on. All right. So what would we do then? Then we would do what's called frequency analysis, which is we count all those A's and B's and C's and D's, and we figure out which letters are the most common. And it's better when we have a large message, larger than the Sabine Gold cryptogram. But when we count all the letters, we're going to find out that they appear in certain percentages. And the English language has very well-known percentages for the letters that are used. If you take the novel Moby Dick or, or if you take the Bible or something and you count the letters that are there, does anyone know what is the most common letter in the English language? E, good. Second most common? T, good. All right. And then you can go on, and then printers know this as well, so that they have the common letters kind of up there where they're typing, and then the uncommon letters, are they're not going to be typing those as much. So an E, which is the most common letter in the English language, generally shows up about 12% of the time. 12.7% of the time. And so if you're doing a frequency analysis on something and you get the most frequent whatever it is, is about 12%, that'll tell you hmm, a couple of things. One is we may be dealing with English because it might not be English. And the other is that particular symbol that showed up 12% of the time is probably an E. It might also be a T. You always have guesswork when you're dealing with these things. So here is another cryptogram called the Winthrop cryptogram from 1650. And we it was an alphabet change. And if we count them and change them and we found out that the most common one there were 27 examples of that and then 17 examples of the next and 16 examples of the next and with a little bit of guesswork the most common one was indeed an e the next one wasn't a t it was either an i or a j but then t came after that so again there is guesswork here and it came out to be an alchemy recipe recipe. Uh, I won't read the whole thing, but it was talking about if you were to dissolve sulfur in something. Now, we don't know what that something is because we only had the symbol show up once. And then it was take excellently well purified bay salt, dissolve or melt it down in some convenient vessel over ye fire, then throw some sulfur of any metal leisurely upon it. Uh, and so by degrees, it will melt in it and become fusible. Okay. So how do you do these frequency analyses? Well, there are tools out there, uh, and it depends how complex of a tool you're going to be comfortable with. If you're in Europe, probably the one they use most often is one that's called CryptTool. It is an open source tool, meaning lots of people are going in and helping with the coding of it. And it does some very fine frequency analyses, but there is also a learning curve with figuring out how to use crypto. Uh, these are some of the people that have been, have been involved with the creation of it. And there are other tools as well that you can use for frequency analysis. We have Multideck, uh, we have Rumkin, and we have CryptoCrack. Uh, and there are many others. One of my personal favorites is Rumkin. Rumkin, it's very easy to use. It's on the web. You can go to his site, rumkin.com. And he has lists of different kinds of code systems. Uh, he also, some of them will do frequency analysis. In some cases, he'll just say, paste in the code you got. And his system will just try to crack it just as it is. Might work, might not, but it's one place to start. Again, uh, a lot of trial and error. Uh, this is also Rumkin site. And using uh, some of these tools, and maybe hill climbing, and we come back to Sabine Gold. And the answer was a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And there are many other monoalphabetic substitutions that can also be solved with these tools. So transposition, moving things around. I'm going to give an example of something called a turning grill cipher. Uh, 
This is where you have a grill. Sometimes this is also called a carden grill. And you will have letters that are written into the holes on the grill. So along the top here, we've got to be or not to be with some X's filling it in so I get a specific length. And then I'm going to write in the letters in order to be or not to be into these holes. And then I'm going to turn the grill by 90 degrees and keep writing. So here's an animation for it. So again, to be and turning the grill and continuing. and then filling in with the X's. All right, then I take each row of that grid, so E-T-T-O and then O-B-R-N, and you can see written along the bottom there in yellow, that is the ciphertext that would be sent saying, okay, here it is. Now, on the other side, ideally, they have that same grill and they're going to write the message into their grill and then extract the message that way. Uh, these are very difficult to uh, decrypt if someone is along the middle grabbing that ciphertext message as it goes by. And it's different from substitution ciphers. With substitution ciphers, the more ciphertext you have, the easier it becomes to crack it because you can get those mathematical patterns that take a code apart. With turning grills, it's the opposite. The more ciphertext you have, the more difficult it is to crack it because of the methods you're using to crack it, which again are a lot of trial and error. Uh, these are examples of actual turning grill messages uh, from different centuries. and they're very hard to solve. Uh, there is a computer system that's called hill climbing, which works very well at cracking uh, messages, but that's outside of the scope of this particular talk. So when we're solving a turning grill, how do we tell that we're solving it? What are the techniques that we can use? Like with substitution, we know E is the most common letter, T, and going on from there. With turning grill, all the letters are still there, okay? We, we, don't, we haven't substituted any letters out, so E is still going to be the most common letter there. But what you can look for is you can look for letter pairs and uh, frequencies, if you're looking for the frequencies of letter pairs. So in English, the most common letter pair is TH like the, there, that, these, TH shows up a lot, and then EN and ER, those are also what we would call a high score letter pair. And then low score letter pairs would be things like QR, CX, PF. These are things that tend not to show up in the English language. So as you're doing this, again, trial and error of trying to solve the turning grill, you're going to see if you can put letter pairs together that make sense that are common letter pairs assuming that's in english again that is something that can add more complication so now we're going to talk about a different kind of system this is nomenclator nomenclators are um, not something that has gotten a whole lot of discussion in mainstream but in the conventions uh, there are no more and more nomenclator messages being found in the history archives so a nomenclator is a combination of a monoalphabetic substitution system, but it also includes complete words. And this is an example of what's called a nomenclator table. And if you saw in the news recently that there were letters that were found by Mary, Queen of Scots, that were discovered, they'd been misfiled in the French National Library. Someone thought they were in Italian, but they were actually in French and they were from Mary, Queen of Scots. And her system tended to be a nomenclator system. I'll be giving a whole talk on that tomorrow if anyone's interested. So um, a nomenclator, this was named after a person 
or a title of a person when there would be some sort of grand um, party and people would enter and they would say, Lord and lady, grapefruit from wherever. That person who called it out would be the nomenclator, all right? He's calling out their names, all right? And this has been used in Europe at least since the 14th century. So here is an example. This is not an actual nomenclator, but just an example of it. So let's say that you wanted to encrypt the message using this table on the left. We want to encrypt the message will come from London to Berlin. All right. So will, the word will, we're going to encrypt one letter at a time. So a W is a 23, an I is a 9, the two L's are each at 12. And then we've got uh, the word come is the same. But now from, because we have a certain number of words that we've already put on our table. So we know that word from, we're just going to put the number 43. And then London also is already on our table. So we're just going to put the number 30 and so forth. Then we spell out two and Berlin is just going to be the number 31. This makes sense. Any questions on nomenclators? Okay. All right. So this is a, a rewritten actual nomenclator table from the 16th century. Uh, here's one from the 17th century. And you can see here along the top, there'll be the letters of the alphabet that they're going to be encrypting. And even here, they've made it more difficult. So the letter D could be encrypted either with the number 24 or the number 205, or the number 27, just to make it a little harder. These are called homophones, or a homophonic system. The letter E, the same way. Then they're going to have a system where they take each consonant and then pair it with a vowel. And again, these are homophones. These could be different numbers. And then we have down here where the actual words, the nomens of this table are. So in this case, uh, say in the middle there, Holland could be this three-digit number, uh, 274. So this is an example of a letter. This is a real letter uh, that was written by Lord Manchester. And you can see that it's a mix of text, what we call clear text. And then when it gets to the juicy bits, then they switch into numbers and that's the encrypted part. And here's the, the numbers that are encrypted. And anybody here that's a big fan of the show Hamilton, uh, I wanted to point out the signature where they say, I, I am sir with great respect, your, your, your servant, Lord Matcher. Even when they're arguing, they'll put, I am your servant and, and yeah. It, it's it's quite funny when they when they talk about that and they're calling each other names, but they say, I am your servant. Okay. So here is another example of ciphertext. And this, they actually made a mistake here. So you'll see that they've got the text, and then in between the lines, they've written what the uh what the decrypted text is. But this is actually a mistake by anyone who's a cryptographer, a cryptanalyst, because they shouldn't have then kept this. This should have been destroyed because anyone who finds this now has a good idea of how the code works and they can try and recreate the nomenclator table based on what they're seeing in this letter. So how do you solve a nomenclator message? Well, easiest method, find the nomenclator table. Uh, <laughs> you don't always have that though. There's actually a database that's being created in uh, Sweden, I believe it's called the decode database, where they are collecting encrypted messages. They are collecting nomenclator tables. So when someone finds one, they can look to see if there's a table already in there, then that way they can try and decrypt it. Or if they're trying to derive the table, again, they can share their notes into the decode database. So here is an example of a French nomenclator message. This is from 1812. And here is the actual table that is used. So you can see that from the left, we have a number that then matches the nomenclator table, which in this case is the, the term lacage. And then when you decrypt the message, you read um, 
you, you decrypt the ciphertext there and it goes from clear text to ciphertext and clear text to decrypted text and clear to decrypted like that. So I don't know who here speaks French, but it'll go, uh, uh, le duc d'Almiti qui lui avait demandé quelques jours de repos après lesquels sa majesté se proposait d'agir de manière. So you're just reading across sentence to sentence to sentence, and you're just taking those bits that are encrypted and just flowing from clear text to decrypted ciphertext. So if you don't have the nomenclator table, how do you want to crack it? Well, it depends on whether the table was well constructed or not. Many codes are taken apart because the encryptor made a mistake in the way that they were encrypting things or they got sloppy. Uh, for example, if we go back to turning grill. If, for example, when they were writing in all the things into the grill, but they were doing it a little bit above the line. So the, the, the letters were a little bit higher. So then when you're looking at the ciphertext, you'll see that some letters are, are straight across and then some are a little higher and straight across and then higher. So, you know, aha, when the girl was in this position, I'm waving my hands in the air, I apologize. But, um, but you can tell those letters that are a little off the line probably means that they were written when the grill was in a particular position. And that's one way to take those kinds of codes apart. Okay, so here's another example of something that wasn't well written. This is an actual message that was sent from the Vatican to a papal diplomat in Poland in 1573. And if you look carefully at the way it's written, you can see that all the numbers all the way through there, it's it's two digit numbers. There's like tons and tons of nines in there. So it's like two digit, two digit, two digit. And then every so often there'll be a three digit number. So the assumption was made that those two digit numbers were probably letters. And then the three digit numbers were the words. And using that system, they were able to then do frequency analyses on the letters and were able to take it apart. And I don't have Italian, it's not one of my languages, but um, there was the number 608 and giudicando che con nessuna cosa si possa resti and, and, and so forth. So the whole message came apart once they were able to figure that out with the letters. And then 608, we may never know what 608 means because we don't have anything to compare it to. And this is an active field of research. I have gone into the archives and found nomenclator messages. If you just get lucky and you look in the right spot, or maybe you're looking in an area where there were other nomenclator messages and you just kind of flip through, oh, look, here's more nomenclator messages. So very active field of research right now. So summary of everything I've talked about here, we've got different kinds of encryption systems. We've got substitution where you're swapping one letter for another. We've got transposition, uh, where you're moving the letters around. We've got steganographic, where it's not entirely clear that there even is a message, like the guy with the tattoos on his, on his skull, and mnemonic, or the abbreviation types of ciphers. The techniques are going to involve trying to figure out what kind of method you may be dealing with, uh, and then identifying the context of it. You know approximately when it was written. That may give you some ideas of, of what, was, what was written. And then the most common method that's used from there is frequency analysis. Count the letters, count the letter pairs. And then there's a lot of guesswork, a lot of guesswork. Code, code breakers don't go in and go, aha, I think it's this, and then crack it. There's forward and back and forward and back. And then lather, rinse, repeat. So um, I have here some uh, URLs that may be helpful. At the bottom here, we've got the rumkin.com, we've got cryptool.org, and oh, mysterytwister.org is a place where people will upload ciphers, and you can kind of go in and uh, give them a try. They've got them from very easy to very difficult. Um, Please rate the panel, this panel in the app. I will be speaking again tomorrow at 2.30 on the ciphers of Mary Queen of Scots and also the ciphers of the Zodiac Killer, which were recently cracked. 
and I'll be talking about how they were cracked and a little bit about what they say. And um, thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, questions? So I know there are some alphabets that have more letters. There are some where the written language, each symbol is a combination of characters like in Korean. And then, of course, you have some like Japanese that are a mix of images. And mm -hmm. have you run into any of those? And are there clever approaches for each of those situations? Oof. Um, good question. Complicated question. Uh, I have dealt with ciphers in Russian, so the Cyrillic alphabet. And that one's rough because not only do they have a different number of letters, but the way that they order their alphabet changes depending on which part of the country that you may be in. Uh, so um, again, a lot of trial and error. Uh, I've never dealt with a cipher in Korean. I would love to see one. If anybody has one, I please write to me. I would love to see it. Got any experience with uh, using LLMs with ciphers? Yeah. Any uh, anything you want to say about their usefulness? Ah, uh, uh, LLMs, that? Chat GPT, right? Yeah, um, LLM means large language model. With Chat GPT or, or AI. I'm going to do a lot of air quotes here. AI. <laughs> Low um, yeah. What is or is not artificial intelligence? I know that the science track was, was doing some stuff on there. I mean, some people are so confused right now about what AI is. They think if you go to Google and you type the word peach and it shows you pictures of peach trees, they're going, ah, that's AI. It showed me like, no, it's a search engine. And it's not the same as, as artificial intelligence. Um, so are they any good at cracking ciphers though? Or, or are you I, even... I, oh, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> so when um, chat GPT became popular and I immediately went out and I paid to get the 4.0 version and uh, my, one of my favorite ciphers is Kryptos, which is a sculpture at the center of CIA headquarters it has uh, four codes on it. Three of the four have been solved. Fourth has not been solved yet. It's one of the most famous unsolved codes in the world. And it's 97 letters at the bottom of the sculpture. So I went to chat GPT and I said, okay, uh, can you give me a 97 letter sentence that has the word Berlin at the 64th position? And it couldn't do it. It couldn't do it. Uh, and I, it, it just gave, it was hallucinating. It went off. And I said, well, can you give me a 97 letter sentence? And it couldn't do it. <laughs> and I asked it five times to give me an English sentence with 97 letters <laughs> and it couldn't do it. Every time it would give me something with different numbers of letters. So these, these LLMs do amazing things. Like I can write a haiku and then translate it into 17 different languages, but they can't count. <laughs> they have not yet been trained how to count. So, um, uh, yeah, I can I can talk a bit longer about AI and and LLMs, but right now they are not any good whatsoever at solving codes. It's just not the way they're written. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just looking for some clarity uh, or distinction regarding the uh, nomenclature type cipher versus sure. the alphabet substitution type cipher. Mm -hmm. I noticed that in both cases. Uh, there are numbers substituted for letters, and uh -huh. uh, what what specifically would designate one as one versus the other, a nomenclator versus an alphabet substitution? Sure. or Because there's clearly like an overlap. Sure, and definitely overlap, and that uh, combination of systems is one of the things that makes nomenclator so difficult. It's a combination of monoalphabetic substitution of homophonic ciphers and code books. They're all kind of mushed in there. Uh, I would say a monoalphabetic substitution, that's all it's doing is it's just uh, letters to letters or letters to symbols, stop, full stop. So the variance of, of numbers that could mean the same letter is, is a big part of it. If it's a variance of numbers that could mean a letter, we're no longer at a monoalphabetic substitution. Now we're at what's called a homophonic right. substitution, which is actually one of the things that the Zodiac Killer did, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, each one of these things makes a cipher more difficult to solve. Did that answer your question? Yes, keep thank ask, you. Keep asking. If I didn't get it right, keep asking. No, that, that, that's exactly what I wanted okay. to know. The nomenclator right. is just a, a mixture of, of the yeah. different uh, types. Yep, thank you. it's a mix. Okay. All right. 
She's either leaving or she's going to ask me. Okay, hi. Right. Hey, um, I, would, I was just curious, what would you say are the most um, important sort of foundational skills for getting good at code breaking, like programming or mathematics or like skill with languages? So are you talking code breaking in terms of recreational code breaking or like you want to work for the NSA code breaking? Um, I guess both. Let's okay. start with, um, yeah. Okay, so um, recreational code breaking, you want to get good it's going to be mostly English ciphers and you're going to want to uh, get really good at frequency analysis. There is a group called ACA, the American Cryptogram Association. I would join them because they send out uh, uh, pamphlets or uh, newsletters every uh, month or every two months, if anyone here is a member and can correct me on that, uh, where they put different kinds of uh, puzzles that have been created by other ACA members and then you get to solve them and if you solve them you get points and then they give prizes for the people with the most points. There's actually the annual meeting of the ACA is going to be later in this month uh, at, in uh, Phoenix but you can also log in via Zoom if you want to attend that way. Um, so that's historical or what we call classical ciphers. And if you want to work for the NSA, uh, you want to learn math, math and math and math and math, mm -hmm. or as they say in, in Europe, maths, maths and maths, and I'm not going to say that more than twice. Um, <laughs> uh, but that's, that's really what they're looking for is the mathematical techniques. And even if you don't work for the NSA, they've also got always trade systems where uh, the NSA may uh, bring in a math professor from some other university to be there for six months. And that way they can kind of share information in both ways to kind of uh, improve everyone's skill in mathematics. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and again, if you want to uh, work for the government, also learning other languages can be very helpful. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Sure. What's the NSA? NSA, sorry, uh, NSA is one of the government agencies in the United States that, and their main thing is cracking codes. They're called the National Security Agency. Um, the joke in uh, in the Washington D.C. because uh, their very secret agency is that it really stands for no such agency. <laughs> um, but uh, now they're they're opening up a little bit more. So the NSA is, if you have a code, or the NSA's remit is cracking codes of other countries. <laughs> but there are some things about if there are bad people from other countries in the United States, how can the NSA find those people? And, and it's a big debate on finding the bad guys without spying on American citizens. And sometimes it's it's a very, very fine line sometimes. But I know a lot of people at the NSA and they are very motivated, very motivated to protect American citizens. But the, sometimes it is a very fine line. Okay. Yeah. Um, other agencies, uh, there's the CIA, which is the Central Intelligence Agency, which is involved with um, spying on other people in other countries. There is the FBI, which is the Federal Bureau of Investigation, which is tasked with uh, uh, broad uh, people counterfeiting money. Um, we call a lot of these the TLAs, which means three-letter agencies. There's a lot of those. Okay. Um, so I forget the exact details about this, but like back in World War II, I think, when the U.S., um, enlisted the Navajo people to uh -huh. what what made that so difficult to crack? Sure. sure. Um, and that was an amazing project where uh, they enlisted uh, many different uh, Native American tribes who each had their own language. And these people were called the code talkers. And they would receive, they would get a message that needed to be translated in English, they would convert it into their own language, and then they would say it to someone else with their own language on the other side. And because their languages had 
very different structures in terms of not just the words, but the, the grammar and the way things were put together. There were some tests that were done, like should a message be sent in Morse code or should it be sent with this encryption machine? And code talking <clears throat> was um, the fastest way of communicating a message. And they use it was Navajo, Navajo. It was Cherokee. It was Comanche. Uh, there were probably a dozen other Native American tribes that were used as well. But the most famous one is, is the Navajo, especially because there was like a movie with Nicolas Cage in it. Um, but there were many, many different tribes. And to my knowledge, of all the code talking that was done, none of the messages were ever decrypted by the enemy. Well, this book right here looks really interesting. How do I get a <laughs> copy of that? <laughs> Why, thank you. Um, th so this is a book that, uh, it's my most recent book I've written for. Uh, this came out uh, late last year, and it was written with uh, Klaus Schme, who is a, a big uh, European crypto blogger. Uh, we actually, okay, so here's the funny story about it. So we wrote, our first version of the book we wrote, and it came out in England, and it was, released on December 10th, 2020. And in the book, we, we covered a lot of the things that I've just talked about, but much deeper dives, and also unsolved codes. And one of the unsolved codes that we covered was that by the Zodiac Killer. This was a, a serial killer in California who had sent encrypted messages to the newspapers saying, if you can solve this, it tells you more about who I am, and then they never did. But uh, one of the big messages by him, it had been over 50 years, and no one had cracked it. And so we were covering it in our book as a famous unsolved code. So again, our book came out on December 10th, 2020. December 11th, okay, one of our colleagues, David Aranchak, contacted me and said, we just cracked Zodiac. You're going to have to rewrite the book. <laughs> Um, and so at first you check it because people are saying they've solved unsolved codes every year. We, we get two, three uh, people who say that they've solved the Voynich or the Dorbello or the Zodiac or whatever. And um, But it was checked and they've really cracked it. It was an amazing accomplishment by three men on different continents. Uh, Dave Aranchek, uh was in Virginia and then Jarl Van Eyke was in uh, Belgium uh, and then Sam Blake was in Australia. And working together online on the internet they'd figured out how to crack the zodiac message so klaus and i got together and we started rewriting the book there were already a bunch of things we wanted to change anyway and so this came out in the united states in september of last year um and i have copies here for 30 dollars. and uh i will take paypal and venmo as well as cash by the way so thank you for that for that lovely segue sorry go ahead uh, first of all thank you so much this is a fantastic panel thank you lots of information um how do you know you broke the cipher because they're not going to put the answer next to the question so for example for the zodiac how do they know how do you know yes you solved the zodiac code um well it is um tested by third parties so it's not enough for someone to say i have cracked cryptos sure. they then need to provide the answer and they also need to provide enough of the method that someone else can then independently verify what it is that they did. It's it's basically scientific method. Can a can an outside laboratory then replicate the same results? All right. So if I have a cipher and says, here, test this, mm -hmm. and somebody says, Oh, it says the answer is 27. Uh -huh. And somebody says the answer is 22. Uh -huh. And they provide the same, they provide their, their methods and mm -hmm. yeah, you do this is 27, you do this is 22, mm -hmm. which one is correct? Well, then you have something called, uh, I think it's a uh, unicity distance. It, if something's a very, very short cipher, sure. then it, that it could potentially be 27 or 22 or 37, meaning there's multiple possible answers. Mm -hmm. It's... It, there are multiple possible answers and the cipher was very short and okay. um so that there's often discussion of what is the minimum length of a cipher that you need to have in order to know that there can be one answer. possible solution okay 
Thank you. Okay. I'm I'm sure this is a very obvious question. Oh, bring it. I love it. I love uh, easy questions. Uh, so like it it seems to me and I guess I just didn't see it in the examples not knowing anything about, you know, the the history much more than what I saw here, but like it seems like if you just got the original message like 20% wrong, like it just everything was spelled horrifically. Uh-huh how would you i well you know uh, whoever i mean wouldn't that make it really hard <laughs> uh, so i can say it again in a different way so if, for instance you know you're writing a message to somebody everything is spelled wrong okay right so your i guess your basic analysis wouldn't work because you know you would put ch's where s's go and you uh -huh. would put so like oh it looks like german Okay. So, you, you know, sure. it's like, bleh. okay. Okay. Yeah. It's one way of sending a message. It's not particularly secure um, because other people could probably figure it out very quickly. Well, I guess so. Like if you do that, 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 but then you use an algorithm on top of, you know, like, Oh, a super encryption on top of that. Well, well I mean, or whatever. Uh -huh. if that, yeah. Okay. So what's, so, so what's your question? Well, so, so I guess like in the examples, I guess specifically like from the 1700s, right? Uh -huh. Everything was spelled right at the end. Uh -huh. So I guess if like you were looking for somebody who may maybe knew the basic stuff, you were making a message that wasn't spelled right to start with mm -hmm. and wouldn't end up spelled right. You know, you know, I guess if that makes sense. No, I have to, I'm sorry. It's, but... it's possible. Well, okay. I guess it's just like. Yeah. It would also mess up your frequency analysis, right? Right, right. That, that, that was kind of sounded by the whole way to start. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. All right. All right. My, my apologies if I'm not yeah, understanding. That, that okay. That would mean whoever was decoding the message would have to be a horrible speller. Yeah. They have to spell the same way you spell it. it Right. So you could potentially write a message that would have no ease in it, which would then foul up anyone who was trying to do a frequency analysis, say. Is that sort of, yeah? I guess, yeah, I guess I just think, I guess if I was going to do it, I would be sneaky. <laughs> if you were going to do it, you'd be sneaky like that. <laughs> sure. The thing. I'm sorry. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. What would you do with that then? Like if you wrote a message with no ease in it, how would you solve that? Well, well I can I can answer it, that. <laughs> yeah, if if you wrote a letter with no ease, it would be deliberately uh trying to foul up anybody who was intercepting the message. So, um as a cryptanalyst, uh it would make it much more difficult. You go, hmm, the you know, the the frequencies just don't work out, don't work out. But if you had enough of it, eventually you'd start to be going, "Ah, I see what they did." Blanca, it's good to see you back. It's been five years. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> My question was going to be, did we solve the CIA thing? You already addressed that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but We've I was going to ask clues, but we still haven't solved it. Right. I was going to also just say, um, in the example of the, the circular poles, with the diameter uh -huh. needed for the... I forget the what you Yeah. Uh -huh. By militarily giving... A certain diameter to each of the the two parties, then any 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 in between party could not break that back. It has to go to the one with the exact me measured diameter. So the question I have is, how does the person at the other end know which diameter? And the you see what I'm saying? The code. Yeah, it 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 would have to be communicated some beforehand. some way, right? Yeah. In, in plain text, or, or they would just have to understand that. Right. Or right. Probably before the battle. Whoever, right. whoever the spy master was would have two sticks and go, you have this one, you have that right. one. And that can go by rank. Uh-huh. See, so they would know, right? Uh -huh. And and I was going to answer his question a little bit is because if these two people know each other, they could have predisposition and know, okay, I'm not putting ease in any of my stuff. Yeah. So it comes through. You can't encrypt that as easy because of the frequency. But the other end knows the guy doesn't spell right. So there you go. <laughs> yep. Very true. Okay.
Hey, uh, do you happen to have any opinion of the Voynich Manuscript, or are you just kind of tired <laughs> talking about it? Voynich Manuscript. It depends what day you ask me. Um, so, uh, and I've given entire talks on the Voynich. Um, it's either a hoax or uh, perhaps a cipher used by a particular family that was selling uh, snake oil herbs. Um, or perhaps it's in a language from a micro country that no longer exists. Um, today, my feeling is that uh, Emperor Rudolph II around that time was known to have a collection of curiosities. He loved purchasing curiosities, and I think someone created a curiosity for him to purchase. How often do you uh, run into red herrings? And when do you go, uh, this is not a real cipher and just throw it away? <laughs> How often do I run into red herrings? Mm -hmm. um, uh, quite often. Uh, people will often just come up and they'll give me a piece of paper and say, hey, I wrote a code, will you solve it? And my answer is usually no. <laughs> <laughs> because it takes a long time to, to look into a cipher and there has to be a reason to do it. Uh, so I'm going to want to know, is this really something that is, is it first, my first question is, is this historical or is it modern? Um, was it created within the last few years? If it's created within the last few years, I'm probably not interested in it at all. If they say, oh, I found this, uh, in my great, great grandfather's, uh, attic, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be very interested in it very, because it's more likely to be something that was actually sent with an intention of being solved. All right. Okay. Thank you. And uh, anyone who wants a book. <laughs>